welcome to Science View, where we cover the latest advances in Japanese science and technology. I'm your navigator, Tomoko Kimura, and this week's Science Watcher is Dr. Yoichi Sato from the Institute of Industrial Science, University of Tokyo. Hello, I'm glad to be here with you today. Here is today's lineup. Today on the leading edge, we have aquaporins, which are tiny holes or channels that deliver life-sustaining water to every part of our body. We'll bring you the latest information on the role they play and how they work. And on J Innovators, Michelle? Today I'll be introducing an innovator, or Takumi, who developed an electroconductive thread by coating the fibers with carbon nanotube. Carbon nanotube is extremely small and is one millionth of a millimeter. Coating a thread with this substance makes it electroconductive and able to radiate heat. We'll share with you the story behind it, the development process, the struggles he faced, and the solution that he found in the most unlikely way. But first, today's science news from Dr. Sato. The news that recently caught my attention was the bluefin tuna, which are a prized delicacy spawned for the first time at the land-based research facility. The spawning took place at the Fisheries Research Agency's facility in Nagasaki. On May 16th, the facility confirmed the spawn in a tank that had been prepared specifically for that purpose and collected approximately 9,600 fertilized eggs by the next morning. Bluefin tuna have previously spawned at offshore facilities and aquariums, but this is the first time in the world that they've spawned at a land-based research facility. To remedy the problem of a dwindling wild population, the government funded the construction of this facility, which was completed last year. Because bluefin tuna spawn are greatly affected by natural factors, the tank's temperature and daylight hours were carefully controlled to create a condition that would be conducive to spawning. The fisheries research agency's goal is to establish a system and technology that would allow them to steadily produce 100,000 fry annually by 2016. The successful spawning is the first step towards that goal. The population of Pacific bluefin tuna, which Japan is the greatest fishing nation of, is at an all-time low due to overfishing and other factors. Data shows that about 98% of caught fish are immature fish that have never produced offspring, and this is hastening their decline. I hope that they successfully establish technology for artificially spawning and raising bluefin tuna as a new measure toward recovering the population. And now for the leading edge. Today's topic is aquaporin. Our bodies are said to be 60% water, and aquaporins transport water on a cellular level. They are found in cell membranes and are a unique protein with holes. Dr. Sato, aquaporins play a vital part in our bodies, but their existence was only discovered some 20 years ago. Well, the idea of water channels was proposed over 100 years ago, but their existence was only confirmed in 1992. The news made headlines around the world at that time. Is it true that aquaporins play a big part in the moisture level of our skin? Yes, it is. Then it may be one of the secrets to a beautiful complexion. Yes. On the other hand, if they don't function properly, then it could lead to different illnesses. So these water channels affect our lives in a major way. Let's look into the world of aquaporin. It's the source of life, water. Scientists have discovered the existence of tiny ultra-micro water holes that deliver water to every part of the body. They're called aquaporins. They play a big part in the body. If they don't function properly, then the body can't produce sweat or tears, and it can lead to several diseases. In 2003, Dr. Peter Agre of the United States was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his discovery of aquaporin. I think, I think the um, discovery of the aquaporins, which our lab played a major role in, was, was very, very lucky. It was, it was really a very happy accident. We say serendipity. Dr. Agre specialized in hematology. 
He was studying a protein contained in the membrane of red blood cells, which determine a person's blood type. For days, he held experiments in an attempt to extract the target protein from red blood cells, when he realized that another unrelated protein kept appearing in large amounts. It was a new protein that he'd never seen before. And we did not know what this new protein did. And in fact, at first it was quite a nuisance. And, uh, but it seemed very curious. So we investigated it further. And we did that, we discovered it was the water transporter. How did they confirm that this protein was indeed a water transporter? Dr. Agre used frog eggs to test his hypothesis. Frog eggs are protected by a surface membrane that has low water permeability. He had the idea of cloning the RNA responsible for producing the protein and injecting it into frog oocytes. This would cause a large amount of the protein to be produced in the egg's membrane. If these really were water channels, then it would cause the eggs to fill up with water. Here are photos from the actual experiment. On the left is an ordinary egg, and on the right is a test egg. When placed in water, the egg that had been injected with the RNA began swelling up. This proved that the new protein was a water channel. Then he tested six new oocytes injected with the RNA. Each one exploded like popcorn. Bang, bang, bang. It was very, very astonishing. The experiment showed that the water passed through the aquaporin's channels and flooded the cells. Precisely. Aquaporins are found in plants as well. And like the frog eggs, plant cells will become bloated if they are filled with water. Take a look at this. This is a Japanese morning glory and it blossoms. Aquaporins play a big part in this process. When the flower blossoms, the cells at the base of the petals are filled with water through the aquaporins. The water causes the cells to expand, and the surrounding cells are pushed out, causing the flower to blossom. So we've seen what aquaporins can do, but what do they look like themselves? Please take a look at this. Aquaporins, the newly discovered protein that allows large amounts of water to pass through. How exactly does it work? Professor Yoshinori Fujiyoshi from Kyoto University is using a cutting-edge electron microscope that he developed to learn more about its identity. This is a cryo-electron microscope and it was used to capture the world's first image of the water channel. Standard electron microscopes focus a strong electron beam at a specimen, which is placed in a vacuum chamber to study its structure. However, it doesn't work on moisture-filled substances like protein, as water evaporates in the chamber, causing the specimen to dry up. Another major problem was that the strong electron beam would sever the protein's bonds, causing it to fall apart. So Fujiyoshi placed aquaporins that had been dissolved in water onto a small metallic grid. He then used liquid nitrogen below minus 190 degrees Celsius to instantaneously freeze it. By freezing the water, he can keep it from evaporating. Meanwhile, the interior of the cryo-electron microscope is also cooled with liquid nitrogen to minus 270 degrees Celsius. This technology of freezing the fragile protein to the limit and hardening it made it possible for them to capture its natural structure. By observing it from slightly different angles and analyzing hundreds of data with a computer, they were able to determine the aquaporin's true form. This is the world's first look at an aquaporin's structure. At first glance, it looks like a distorted clump, 
but split it open and you'll see that there's a thin hole down the center. The thinnest part of the hole is three angstrom, or a 0.3 millionth of a millimeter, which is barely big enough for a water molecule to pass through. All other molecules are bigger than water molecules and cannot pass through. This water-specific protein is embedded in the cell's membrane and conducts billions of water molecules every second. We've learned that aquaporins let water in and keep everything else out. And they pass water through at an incredible rate. These two amazing functions are extremely important to the body. So aquaporins have a hole that is just big enough for one water molecule to pass through. Yes, let's take a look at its structure. This is the latest image of an aquaporin that was taken with an electron microscope. There are many kinds of aquaporins, and so far they have confirmed 13 types in mammals. This is a structure of one of them. It's called aquaporin-4. And are those water particles lined inside? Yes. If you look at it through an electron microscope, you see that eight water molecules are neatly aligned. Does the number eight have some kind of significance? It does. Upon observation, scientists learned that there are eight spots inside aquaporin's channel where water molecules fit in nicely. Water molecules are shallowed from one spot to the next, like billiard balls, and they travel very fast. Every second, three billion water molecules pass through the channel. So aquaporins have the outstanding ability to transport water in an instant. Aquaporins have the important job of transporting water, which is crucial for biological activity. But what happens if they don't function properly? Next, we'll take a look at the connection between aquaporins and diseases. A lack of tears causes a painful condition called dry eye. The number of people suffering from this condition is on the rise. Recent studies have revealed that aquaporins may be closely related to a certain type of dry eye. It's called Sjögren syndrome and is when a person can't produce tears even if they're sad or have something in their eye. Tears are produced by lacrimal glands, which are located in the back of the eyelids and pass through ducts to moisturize the eyes. These are the lacrimal gland cells that produce tears. This is a cross-section microscopic image. Surrounding the duct, which is shown in light blue, are numerous aquaporins, which are shown in brown. The tears that are created in the cells pass through the aquaporins into the ducts. But people that suffer from Sjögren syndrome lack aquaporins around the duct. A lack of aquaporins means that the tears have no way of getting out. Professor Kazuo Tsubota of Keio University wondered if there was a way to stimulate the lacrimal gland and get aquaporins to surround the ducts. Stimulation of the lacrimal gland cells is necessary for the aquaporins to be in the proper place. It's similar to the way our muscles shrink if we don't use them. If our lacrimal glands aren't stimulated, then they begin to malfunction. My guess is that some kind of aquaporin is also involved. What kind of stimulation is needed to gather aquaporins to the tear ducts? Subota is currently experimenting with mice and studying the mechanism behind how aquaporins are gathered around the duct. Meanwhile, another study reveals that an excess of aquaporins can be life-threatening. When a brain is injured in an accident or damaged as a result of a brain tumor or stroke, water can accumulate inside the brain. This is a symptom known as cerebral edema. 
This is a brain with cerebral edema. Compared to a healthy brain, the left side is swollen with water and putting pressure on the space in between. Too much pressure on vital parts of the brain can be fatal. Professor Kazuya Sobue of Nagoya City University believes that the aquaporins in the brain cells play a part in causing cerebral edema. The aquaporins are found on the side facing the capillaries and serve as channels for conducting water to and from the bloodstream. This is a microscopic image of brain cells. Experiments have shown that when the brain receives some kind of damage, there is a sudden and temporary increase of aquaporins, which are shown in brown in the cells near the affected area. Water from the blood vessels floods into the brain cells via the aquaporins, causing the brain cells to swell and cerebral edema to occur. Why is there an increase in aquaporins? Sobue and his team are currently conducting experiments which include artificially depriving brain cells of oxygen to learn the mechanism behind the increase in aquaporins following brain damage. So far he's learned that several substances act as a trigger and cause the brain cells to mass produce aquaporins. So far, we've learned that various mechanisms cause an increase of aquaporin-4. If we can find a way to shut down a part of the mechanism, if we can somehow block it, then we can keep brain edemata from forming, an increase of aquaporin-4, and possibly develop a drug that can cure brain edemata. So too little or too many aquaporins are detrimental to the body. Are there any other diseases that are related to aquaporins? Yes, there is neuromyelitis optica, which is caused by a lack of aquaporin-4, and it's found more commonly in women. Its main symptoms are vision disorder and spinal disorder. It is also associated with myasthenia gravis and Sjögren syndrome, which was shown in the video area. Aquaporin-4 was also linked to brain edema, so it must play a vital part in keeping our bodies functioning properly. Yes. In fact, aquaporins also play a big part in childbirth. While the baby is inside the womb, its lungs are filled with amniotic fluid. When the baby is born, the liquid doesn't drain out of its mouth. Instead, there is a temporary increase of aquaporin-4 around the baby's lungs and the liquid is sucked up into the cells. That's when the lungs switch from amniotic fluid to air. The baby is immediately able to breathe and let out its first cry. Wow, it's fascinating to know that aquaporins are involved in childbirth. It wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that aquaporins have supported us since birth. to meet a Takumi or innovator who created this black thread. It looks like an ordinary thread, but this one is quite unique. When you take the thread and place it like this. Look. This thread conducts electricity. Ichinomiya City is located in the northwest of Aichi Prefecture. The city is famous for its long-standing textile industry. This thread was created at a dye house that has been in business for close to a century. Hello, Michelle. Thank you for coming. I'm Hachiya. Here is today's Takumi. Masaaki Hachiya is the creator of the thread that conducts electricity. The secret of this electric conducting thread is in its black color, right? 
Yes, that's right. This is the color of carbon nanotube. The surface of the thread is coated with it. Carbon nanotube is a cylindrical matter made from carbon atoms. It's one nanometer in diameter. However, it can conduct heat and electricity better than any metal. A business associate brought me this black ink-like pigment and asked me to dye with it. I didn't know what the substance was at the time. So I tried using it, but the material wouldn't retain the color. So I told my friend, I can't dye anything with it. Then he said, I thought so. This is actually a special substance called carbon nanotube. It's a conductive material, and he wanted to make an anti-static thread with it. You know, a thread for making clothes that won't collect static electricity. So you wouldn't have to worry about static electricity if you had this thread woven in. That's right. Because it looked similar to black ink, the Takumi thought it would be easy to use it as a dye. But when he tried it out, he found that it peeled off easily. Oh, you're right. It comes off and stains your hand. It's no good. That's right. It looks like it's dyed, but closer inspection shows that the liquid hasn't penetrated the center. Each fiber has to be coated or else it wouldn't conduct electricity. Hachia decided that a conventional dyeing method wasn't an option. With the delivery date closing in, he had no choice but to dye it by hand. This meant that the thread had to be soaked in the dispersing liquid and the liquid rubbed in by hand. It was a very primitive method. It took the Takumi over 10 hours to make a 100-meter sample. What was the reaction to the completed thread? Well, I presented it to Hokkaido University, but when they tested it, it caught on fire. It conducted electricity really well. We realized that its excellent conductivity meant that we could convert a high electrical voltage into heat. We decided to focus on that trait. So it wasn't really a failure. In a way, it led to a revolutionary idea. Yes, you can say that. But finding a way to mass produce the product and create a steady supply was very difficult. It took me a long time to figure it out. How could they coat each and every fiber? Hachi experimented for three years, but couldn't find a solution to this dilemma. Then one day, the breakthrough came in an unexpected way. Hachia's wife was in the garden, transplanting a plant into another pot. After placing the plant in its new home, she tapped the pot with a shovel. The vibrations caused the dirt to settle in between the roots. I thought, that's it. If I use this massage machine and vibrate the thread, then I might be able to get the liquid to reach the center of the thread. This is the prototype that he created after being inspired by his wife's gardening. It actually has a massage machine attached to it. Yes, just like that. Not bad, huh? Yes, it's very unique. This thread was made with that device. Can you see how each part is completely black? Yes, I can. It's dyed all the way to the core. The difference is obvious. He made many upgrades, and this is the current machine. The mechanism is a trade secret, but by replacing the massage machine with a high-frequency oscillation machine, he was able to make mass production a reality. Coated with carbon nanotube to the core, this thread's conductivity and exothermic quality is being used in the development of many products. This is one of them, a snow melting mat that is used in areas with heavy snowfall. A cloth woven with carbon nanotube thread is inside. Let's use a thermograph camera to compare it with a conventional product made with nichrome wire. Compared to the conventional mat, that heats up only in the areas with nichrome wire, 
the mat made with conductive thread is evenly heated. Plus, the running cost is 40% less than that of a conventional product. Although the thread is less than a millimeter thick, it weaves a web of possibilities. Getting to this point required a series of trial and error, and it was tough. All I could think about was this thread. The reason that I was able to create this thread is because I saw that carbon nanotube was full of potential. And not minor potential, but major potential. And it's something that was invented entirely in Japan. I want to send it out into the world as a made in Japan product. I want people to ask for new products, and I look forward to the exchange of ideas. That's my dream. What did you think? Well, it was interesting that he got the idea from watching his wife gardening. His first prototype with the massage machines was very original. Yes, it was. And here's a cloth with a conductive thread woven into it. It's the same type of cloth that's in the snow melting mats. It looks and feels like any other cloth. Yes, but now I'll show you what makes it special. I'll use it to connect this battery and light bulb. So, here we go. See? It turns on, so the cloth really does conduct electricity. Just now, you use a dry cell battery. If you had a higher voltage, then the cloth itself would warm up. It's thin, light, and can be bent freely, so it has a lot of potential applications. That's true. Perhaps you can warm your lunch if you wrap it in this. That's actually one of the ideas they're working on. In addition to the snow melting mat, they're developing new products like wraps and throw blankets. Thank you very much, Michelle. So, Dr. Sato, how would you wrap up today's program? Today, we discussed aquaporin and carbon nanotube, which are both minuscule, but have outstanding traits and perform important functions. And there is still room for further research, so I look forward to learning new things in the future. That's all for Science View. See you next time. <laughs>